All right, hey folks, welcome back. Got a really special guest that, man, I can't tell you how excited I am to have the one and only John Eldridge. He's the author of a book called Wild at Heart and a whole slew of other books. If you haven't heard of him, you really need to tune into this because this man, through you know, just through his original work, Wild at Heart, left a real indelible mark on my, uh, my life when I was just entering the military. So this is like 2001. I find myself at 2nd Ranger Battalion out in Washington State, picked up a copy of this book, Wild at Heart. So like 18 years ago. Holy cow, I'm getting old. Uh, but anyway, just really, really life-changing stuff for me. So uh, I'm going to read you an excerpt, and then I'm going to introduce you to the man, myth, and legend, uh, John Eldridge. So here it is. The desire is there. Every man wants to play the hero. Every man needs to know that he is powerful. Women didn't make Braveheart one of the best-selling films of the decade. Saving Private Ryan, Top Gun, Die Hard Films, Gladiators. The movies a man loves reveal what his heart longs for, what's, what is set inside him from the day of his birth. Like it or not, there is something fierce in the heart of every man. Every man. And so, I mean, the whole book is just kind of riddled with that stuff where you just want to rip off your shirt and be like, I believe! You know, you're just all pumped up. So uh, anyway, just kind of set my soul on fire in a real cool way when I just first started getting into it. I've read a whole bunch of his books, but uh, enough from me. Let's hear from John Eldridge himself. So, hey, John, say hello to our Warrior Poet community. Yeah, great to be on. Uh, really honored to have the conversation with you, John. Looking forward to it. Sounds good, man. Sounds good. Well, hey, uh, first off, uh, you've written a ton on masculinity and life of adventure. Uh, what word can you give to those who are tuning in, who, who may feel a little bit more suffocated by life? You know, like, hey, the book title is Wild at Heart. Man, I'm nine to five, the drudgery and the to-do list. Holy cow, I'm not feeling wild at heart. What would you say oh. to them? That, it, that was me. That was my story. I was dying in a, I was successful. I was in DC. I was climbing the ladder. I was a guy of influence. And I realized one day I have totally lost track. I, I, who am I? What am I doing? I'm, I'm writing. I'm, I'm literally living out somebody else's script for my life. Yeah. This, is, this isn't what I dreamed about. It isn't what I care about. I got to get out of here. And so I think every man gets to some place in his journey. He might be in college. He might be 65. He gets to some place in his journey where he says, come on, there's got to be more. Yeah. Very good. Um, so there was something that you said interested in, interesting in the book, Wild at Heart, where you're saying there are th these three things that are typical to kind of like the man's soul. What, what, what are those? Yeah, okay. This is, this is critical because we live in a time right now, as you well know, that the culture is super confused about um, men and masculinity and, sh you know, is it even a good thing? Like, should we get rid of it? And um, masculinity is huge. It's like we need it. Um, gender is full of dignity and honor and goodness. Uh, and so I just started, I, I, so I had, a, I had a counseling practice as a therapist for a lot of years, and I sat with a lot of guys and listened to their stories, every guy from his boyhood, wants a battle to fight. He wants an adventure and a beauty that he can rescue. Battle, adventure, and, and a beauty. And then you take that and you hold it up to, you know, any popular film for guys, and it's it's all over it, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool. Uh, we mentioned gender confusion and just the times now. 18 years ago when I first picked up your book, man, 18 years. That's gosh, I can't get over that. Holy cow, I'm getting old. Uh, I know I already said that, but still, of you mentioned that in Wild at Heart, like, hey, we've got gender confusion. I know you couldn't have possibly seen how bad it was going to get, but holy cow, what do you say about today's culture right now with the gender confusion? And where's this path lead us? Play the play the prophet. Yeah, it's pretty sad. Um, it's pretty sad. I think um, it's gone from confusion to hostility right? The hashtag me too movement stuff. And I, I just wanted to like do a hashtag. There are still good men out there. Yeah. Like, like every man is not a monster and right. every man is, every man is not an abuser. Right. Like there, there are good men out there. And that quality, that quality 
that sent the, the, the firefighters up the stairs of the World Trade Center when everybody else was coming down, that quality of intervention, you, you want that. And you don't want to take that away from boys. But man, um, gender correctness in school now, gender pronouns, you know, all of that, I, I think we're introducing a, a profound level of despair to mm -hmm. our young, young people, both both male and female. I just think that, why why is the drug addiction rate so high? Why is the suicide rate so high? Like these things are actually connected. Yeah. You take away somebody's identity and you take away what's core to their being. You, you tell them, you can't live that out. What you want, that's, that's all wrong. You gotta be something other than what you are. Whoa, like you have literally just, you know, you pulled the rug out from under them. And where, where, where does that leave our young people? But yeah, you know, alcohol and and unfortunately suicide. And suicide non, is yeah, nonstop video games all the time, just video right? games and Netflix. Right? <laughs> That's right? it. But, That's... but the thing is, here's the thing: you can't get away from it. Look at the video games young men play. Yeah, battle, sure. adventure, and the beauty. Yeah, like even there, like it's so it's DNA, guys. It's in the marrow, right? It, 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 the better thing to do is instead of trying to get rid of it, let's make it let's make it noble. Yeah. Right. Let's give it a dignity and an honor to it. I think that's the answer. Well, what do you say to the young feminist on the other side? Because you've already spoken to masculinity of like, OK, battle to fight, adventure to live, beauty to rescue. Uh, what would you just say to the young gal who's struggling for purpose and identity in a gender confused world? Yeah, right. That your feminine heart matters, that I understand you feel vulnerable in a world like this. And, and the answer feels like be tough be hard, right? But there are some phenomenal qualities to femininity. She wants adventure, yeah. you bet, right? But there's also something in femininity that, that has to do with mercy and love and relationships. Like she is brilliant at relationships and he needs her, yeah. right? And, and so when the little guy, you know, when your little boy wants to jump off the roof, he asks dad, right? Not yeah. mom. But when he gets hurt, he runs to mom. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's the, the genders were meant to be this beautiful pair together. Yeah. I think women can be valiant. I think women can be very fierce, but there is a unique quality to, to her relational heart that we don't want to crush. Because see, here's the irony, gang. The, back in the 60s, the, the feminist movement said, okay, gals, in order to get your dignity, you need to be more like men. Right? Right? Yes. And we, we threw femininity out the window and said, you know, cut your hair short, wear a business suit, be tough in the boardroom. And after about 15 years of that, gal said, yeah, not rewarding, not working for me. And, yeah. and so the, the, isn't that fascinating that now we're now we're swinging back saying, yeah, we don't want you to be like men. Men are bad. Yeah, and now it's men be like women. <laughs> it's like the like, complete opposite swing. You know, about about the feminist type thing of, I think what, what the feminist doesn't realize is that, you know, if you, you try to compete with the men, maybe you beat us and maybe you force our respect, but you don't really captivate us. You know, we, we don't, that's not who we marry. Uh, we may work beside you, but we don't want to marry you. Like my wife, Mrs. Poet, uh, very, very feminine and sweet and yeah she's a gun shooter and whatever and she can protect but i mean she's she's all female you know and i dig that uh so uh yeah man that resonates for sure um, you'd mentioned uh, little guys and so uh, i'm raising two little boys you speak a whole lot about fatherhood they're four and six years old right now so uh we passed the terrorist twos somebody said terrible twos that's not sure it's terrorist twos right. uh, we survived so that's good uh, what, what do i need to make sure that i'm doing with them as i help them into manhood yeah okay this this will be really helpful back to the conversation because i think i think some of the gals watching it are like yeah not with you yet i'm not i don't think you've named it so let me try this every little sure. boy and every little girl are asking one question but they're different questions. Every little boy is asking, do I have what it takes? Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is the core search of men. Men are driven by their search for validation. Am I strong? Do I have what this situation needs? So I've counseled fighter pilots that couldn't talk to their 16-year-old daughters. 
in one situation, they felt like they had what it takes. In another situation, they were terrified, right? Yeah. And learning to be a man is learning to handle life, whatever is asked of you. Okay, so little boy wants, do I have what it takes? So, you know, can he climb the tree? Can he race his bike? Can he ride with no hands? Can he do flips on the trampoline? And, and if his whole world is no, 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 be safe, be small, don't do that, he's not gonna learn that he has what it takes. Sure. And he'll grow up to either be an angry or a very passive man. Okay, so it's really cool. Like he learns to ride his bike with no hands. He wants dad to see it because masculinity is passed on by masculinity. Dad is the one who tells the son, you have what it takes. Right. Self-worth is given by the mom. Your value is given by the mom, but your identity is given by the dad. Now, every little girl is also asking one question, but it's not, it's not the fear of failure. Women don't fear failure like men do. They don't fear exposure to failure like men do, okay? Guys will pose their way through life out of a fear of failure. Gals don't care. Gals are about something else. Every little girl is asking, do you see me? and will you pursue me? Do you see, will I be protected? And will, and do you delight in me? And so, you know, she learns the song, she wants to sing it standing on the coffee table. She gets a new outfit. She wants daddy to see it, right? She, I'm telling you, you, you gals can say, you don't care about beauty, but then dream of your wedding day. Yeah. You're not gonna, you're not gonna show up in sweats, right? Yeah. You, you, you wanna, you want to bring a beauty to the world. And the little girl learns whether or not her, her femininity is a thing of value from mom, but she learns delight from her dad. And if she's not delighted in, this is the number one predictor of teenage, uh, teenage pregnancy and teenage promiscuity, is if that young girl has a dad in her life who loves her. If he is, if he is there and he's engaged, she doesn't need to take her question to boys. Yeah. But if her, if her dad hasn't handled her heart well, she's going to take her question to boys to say, you know, do you do you value me? Do you see me? And and that that gets all weird in the in middle and high school, right? You want to protect her heart by telling her, you know, from from very young, sweetheart, daddy thinks you're amazing, you're powerful, you're smart, you're valued, and and you will be protected. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you know, I deal in the world of self-defense, tactics, firearms, that stuff. And, and as well, uh, as you mentioned, the daughters not having a dad present uh, led to all kinds of promiscuity and teenage pregnancy. With the boys, if they grow up without a dad in the home, usually, I mean, that's a huge predictor of a whole slew of different troubles, yeah. including violence later on yeah. in life. And if you want to figure out if a little kid will commit violence and go to jail one day when he grows up, man, if he grew up without a dad in the home, I mean, obviously, if it, plenty of people grow up without a dad in the home that commit that, but not having that dad just makes those statistics go way out of skew. And one of the big things of violence going up, all these active killers out there and stuff, one big common denominator is not having a present dad or uh, a healthy male role model there along the way. But man, that, yep. that, that, that yep. just seems true. Okay, sure. this is fascinating. So in, a, in an African game preserve several years ago, there was a group of young elephants, young male elephants that were rampaging and they were going in and like trampling crops in the villages. They couldn't get them to stay in the game preserve. They were, they were vandals, okay? All it took, they brought in one older bull elephant. They brought in a male who taught these guys what it means to be male and all the violence stopped, all the vandalism, because they kind of started out on it yeah. and this, this bull elephant would look at them and just stomp his foot. <laughs> and that, that was it, right? Like, That's awesome. These young guys need, uh, they need a male role model. And if they, if they don't get it in a dad, they can get it in a coach. They can get it in a, in a teacher, right? They can get it in an uncle. They, they can get it uh, in the military, right? You can find it in other places. It's not a wash. You're not totally screwed if you didn't grow up with a great dad. Right. Uh, you'd mentioned, you know, just circling back to what you were talking about with uh, you know, the wife who wants to be pursued or that girl. I mean, my wife, man, she hooked me. I was ruined when I 
when uh, our paths crossed and well, we got married. But then what a uh, few people know is our first couple of years was pretty darn tough. I mean, we just, that was hard years. It's just kind of, I thought I was pretty selfless and she did too. And we found out we weren't, but man, our, our marriage was pretty tough for those first couple of years. I don't subscribe to the, the idea that you just find the right one and happily ever after, after is ushered forth. It's taken a lot of work for us. You were in year 12 or, or you know, fully alive, joy, joyful house, but man, it, it's a fight. It's a discipline. How do you keep the, the fires alive? And before you answer, I want to read something from your book. So, uh, let's see, page 16. Uh, so for men, the battle itself is never enough. A man yearns for romance. It's not enough to be a hero. It's that he is a hero to someone in particular, to the woman he loves. Adam was given the wind and the sea and the horse and the hawk. But as God himself said, things were just not right until there was Eve. So um, anyway, there's, I mean, just come on. You're like, John, you nailed the, you nailed the quote. I'm like, yeah, that was, that was correct. So how do we keep the fire alive? Yeah, it's all about the heart, gang. It's all about the heart. It's about his heart and her heart. She needs to understand how his heart is wired and and what it is that kind of makes him come alive. But he needs to learn that too. And guys, like this is huge. You need to know your wife's story. You need to ask her the story of her life. Tell me your story. What was high school like? Was there a boyfriend? Did you fall in love? What was that about? What were the messages that you received over the story and in particular you want to know what's her relationship with her dad like because I'll guarantee you it has shaped her and and there's these landmines now you know set out there for self-protection and if you're not aware of how her dad handled her heart what the messages were to her growing up you're gonna step on that stuff right but that the more that you get to know one another's heart Wow, like marriage can be fantastic. We're 35 years this month and and loving it. And and we got adventures coming up. We we plan we plan adventure together because it makes us both come alive. But it's the pursuit of one another's heart. It's not just a, a list of like tips and techniques. Sure. When she when she feels like you know her heart and you care about her heart, the things she loves, the things she fears her hopes and dreams. Holy cow, is that romantic, guys? That's huge. Sure. Do you have anything that's uh, more on like kind of a daily, weekly thing that would uh, help? Like for me, yeah. uh, we, we're yep. pretty we're pretty strict yep. on once a week, we go out and we go on a date. Uh, that's yep. something for us. Do you have anything kind of like that, whether it's daily or weekly? Uh, you said the big adventure, but man. Yeah, daily, talk to each other. How was your day? What happened? She especially wants to process by talking. And you know, you've probably all heard the data of he's got this many words and she's got this many words, but like talk to her every day. How was your day? What's going on? Process with the, you know, what the kids, how are you feeling about, you know, Johnny or Susie or what's going on? The more you communicate with one another, the less the gaps are in the romance and in the and in the connectedness. Yeah. And then and then also, I like the date thing, weekly. Guys, it can also be an at-home date. It can be a staycation, right? You get the kids to bed, watch a movie together, watch your favorite show, you know, open a bottle of wine and sit on the back porch. Like, that. you can get that time together in the kid years, and you're going to have to fight for it because the kids tend to dominate, and they become the story. But the thing is, the kids aren't the story. Your marriage is the story that the kids get invited into. Yeah. Kids tend to dominate. That's that's such an under exaggeration. Right? <laughs> but right. man, at four and six, little bundles of energy, uh, for sure. Right. So uh, yeah. yeah, good good uh tips. Hey, um kind of speaking about daily routine, man, I'm just so busy all the time and I got my social media and part of that's just even how I make a living, so I can't get away with it get away from it as much as I'd like, but man, just a lot of times I need some refreshment and I'm always kind of looking for, hey, how can I get the best bang for my buck with work and how do I rest and how do I kill it? It's like I'm always killing it at work or at home, but it's hard to kind of be doing well all across the board. 
Uh, so maybe you could speak to kind of daily rhythm stuff and uh, maybe your own daily routine. Okay, the world that you live in is totally jacked. You just have to understand that. People are mad. People live insane pace of life. Every day you need a few moments to yourself. You have to have that. It's not even first about the spouse or first about the kids because if you're not well, you have nothing to offer. Yeah. If, you're t if your tank is empty, you're going to suck as a dad even if you're a great dad. Yeah. Right? You just, you just got nothing to offer. So daily, where is your head space? Right. Where, do you, where do you get quiet? And, and I mean no media, no phone. You know, I, I turn my phone off. And one of the places I found it is, is in my truck. You know, I've got a, I drive a Ford F-250 and I pull in the driveway at home. I don't just jump out and run into the next thing. I pause. I turn the radio off and I just sit there for a minute to just get some headspace, let things clear out so that it's not just, you know, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Sure. I, do it in, I do it in the morning and I do it in the evening. And gang, I'm not talking an hour. Yeah. I don't have an hour. I'm literally talking two minutes. Right. You can get two minutes of just quiet every day. You'll be amazed how energizing it is. Very good. So John Eldridge wakes up at... Six, five thirty. Six, five thirty, and man, take me real quick just through your day. Do you mind? Well, I'm a freak of nature, guys. I, 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 I am, I am a Navy SEAL that lives a monastic life. So <laughs> I, I am a full on, full on warrior. But my life is very monastic. So I get up, and I actually have like forty five minutes of silence to myself, and I'll read and I'll pray, and I'll pray about the people I care about, I pray about my kids, um, and, then I, and then I go into my day, right, and my day is full blown, it's, you know, it's blast and get things done. I love getting things done. Men love to conquer. Right. We love to get it done. I love it, okay? But I pause, I pause, I actually have the, I have, bells go off now in our office building at 10 and 2 every day and everybody in the building now who works for me everybody stops for 60 seconds that's it's, cool. it, it's a it's a group timeout to just say slow down catch your breath get some space 10 and 2 and then when i pull in in the evening i do that thing in the truck i told you about pause right. and a lot of times to be honest i am laying my head down on the steering wheel right because you're just like you're fried from your day, yeah. okay? Dinner with my wife, go into my evening. My evening is also, um, you know, protected time. We don't do a lot of extracurricular stuff. And uh, I'll either watch the Liverpool game or I'll, I'll, uh, I'll watch Stephen Rinella's hunting show or something like that. Come down, John time, that's my day. Sounds cool, man. Very good. I, I've been watching some of your podcasts or listening to some of your podcasts. I, I streamed on YouTube, and then you had talked about sometime during the middle of your work day, you'll get up, go outside your building, and you yes. just turn a couple yes. laps around your uh, yes. office, and that's a good time yeah. for just reset yeah. or prayer time or whatever. And I'm like, man, yep. that's good because, I, like you, I spend a lot of time in front of a screen, uh, yeah. much to my chagrin. And so anyway, just to get outside a little bit is – is good. So I'm going to be, I'm going to be doing that. I've, I mean, I think just taking tiny little rests throughout the day where I truly just check out, change my scenery and get some fresh air every day. That was probably going to pay some dividends. So anyway, that resonated with me and just wanted to let you know, man, they're still influencing me. That's, that's good stuff. But, right on. Uh, right yeah. on. And, and I left out a huge thing. Every day I have nature. Every day I have to get outside. And it may just be that walk around the building. It may be a hike in the hills behind me. But you need nature. In a world that is full of the artificial, you need the real. So rain, snow, wind, whatever, I'm out in it. And I'm just letting it do its good thing. Nature is extraordinarily good for the soul. That's awesome. Yeah, I need to do better about that for sure. All right, can we talk books? Yep. All right, very good. So one, I want to ask you about kind of your books. I have a... I have a sneaking suspicion I know what your favorite book to write was, or at least of late. Uh, but I want to hear, what was your favorite book you've written and uh, why? 
Well, or do you want me to guess first? Yeah, go for it. I'm going to be wrong now. Beautiful Outlaw. Oh, yeah, that's a killer book. That's true. That's anyway, that. I have read six of your books. They were very good. And so uh, good job. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but man, uh, Beautiful Outlaw was a, it was a huge theological work. I mean, it was deep theology. It, it kind of I mean, all of your books have good theology in them, but that one you kind of dorked out in a good Christology kind of way. I mean, like you went full out. One of my greatest friends in the world is a PhD theologian, and he's like, dude, Eldridge is stepping up. And I'm like, I know, not that you were down, but I mean, just kind of like you went full theologian kind of thing on it. I thought it was awesome work, but anyway. Yeah, thanks. Don't scare people off because it's not a <laughs> theological book. It's about it's about the personality of Jesus. That's good. Like, it is. He's, yeah. he's, he's become this creepy religious figure. Like yeah. he's this weird guy in the robe and the stained glass. And I mean, how how can you follow somebody like that? He's, he's just, you know, emasculated Jesus is what we have. Yeah. So the book presents... His, his sense of humor, his playfulness, his fierceness, that he does have a warrior heart. Yeah, I loved, I loved writing that one. I think my answer, honestly, is the book I just finished, whatever it is, because oh, yeah. I've, I've been in it, yeah, right? It, sure. It's, that's where my head is. That's where my heart's been. Uh, and it, it's been a very, very rich thing to have a writing career and, sure. and to have, have that help so many people. Sure. Very good. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, other thing is who are some key influences? So other authors, I know we share one, the great Francis Schaeffer, holy cow, big hero of after Lewis, where Lewis kind of started me on a ha, understanding, just kind of a philosophical worldview. I just inhaled everything by Lewis. I could, I found, found Francis Schaeffer and holy cow, that guy really crafted how I thought, uh, who else, uh, dead you know, or alive, has really— You know, Schaefer is good to mention because people don't know about him anymore. He, yeah. was, he was big in the 60s and 70s because he really understood the hippie movement and the countercultural thing, and he was able to answer our questions. I was part of that, and he really spoke. So Schaefer was great. C.S. Lewis was great. C.S. Lewis's mentor is a Scottish writer named George, George MacDonald. He's phenomenal. Yeah. Okay. Uh I would say contemporary just passed away. Dallas Willard, yeah. uh, just a just a brilliant, brilliant, but very kind man. I had the opportunity to meet him many times, and he's the kind of guy that, like, he literally has probably read ten thousand books. I mean, he is he is, but he is the kindest person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. Just to be around, he doesn't show off his his intellect. Um, so he was he was phenomenal as well. That's and right. then I, I read adventure stuff. I, you know, I, I love uh, mountain climbing and, and bow hunting and, and uh, adventure stories. So I read a lot of that stuff, too. Well, you interested in shooting, man? We got to get together. I'll, I'll run you through the paces. What do you say? I'll, I'm all over it. You into I'm guns? Yep. Yeah. What, what do you got? What do you have? Yeah, yeah. We got the basic stuff, right? We've got the nines and I've got a lot of hunting equipment. So we, you know. 30 out six for elk and a seven MM08 for deer and and next weekend opening weekend of rifle for elk here in Colorado me and my three sons will be in the woods. Awesome stuff, man. Yeah, awesome. Well, cool. Well, hey, I uh, wanted to go ahead and just uh, encourage all you guys tuning in to check out uh, John Eldridge. His ministry is called Ransomed Heart. That's ransomedheart.com. He also has a whole bunch of books. I'm going to go ahead and put your links below in the video description in case you want to check any of those out. I'll put links for you. Also, check out my Amazon store, which has all kinds of books in it as well. So uh, my reading list. You can find John on social media accounts as well. I know Instagram, your ransomed heart. Uh, John, where else can we find you? Yeah, Facebook. You can just Google John Eldridge and it'll pop up. You can listen to our podcast. Um, we talk a lot about this stuff, masculinity, femininity, love, parenting, marriage, that kind of stuff. Awesome. And adventure. And adventure. Awesome. Anything else to just kind of uh, shout out to the Warrior Poet Society here? You know what, guys? No, one, no one's going to tell you this, but your heart matters. You can't neglect the life of the heart. You shut that thing down. Man, it's going to come out and bite you in some way. The addictions, the affairs, all that stuff. Your heart matters, right? Pay attention to your heart. Awesome.
Well, John, thanks so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. And I wanted to personally thank you for the impact you've had on my life, uh, which has been substantial. Pray for your ministry and uh, all those folks that are tuning in as well. So uh, thank you. Yep. Thank you. It's been great to talk with you, John. Yep. You as well. Uh, guys, train hard, train smart. We'll see you next time.